In the first three videos, we have learned how to work with manifolds and tensor fields of any type in Sage. Now we want to do Riemannian geometry. For this, we need the concept of a Riemannian metric and all the geometric objects that derive from it, such as curvature. Let's declare a Riemannian metric. Remember that we have defined a three-dimensional manifold M and a coordinate system consisting of coordinate functions x, y, and z. So I declare a Riemannian metric with Python variable name g and mathematical name given by the string g. And here I set three of the components of the metric, namely those on the diagonal, to some expression in terms of the coordinates. It is again understood that all undeset coordinates are zero. So let's display it. And here is the metric. So only the diagonal uh, uh, terms uh, are, are present. If you want to have an overview of all the coefficient functions in the metric, you can again apply the colon operator. So that gives you a matrix view of your metric. If you want to see how this metric looks in a different chart, you can display it by calling the corresponding chart here. So in our polar coordinates, our metric uh, would, would look like this. Uh, now it's expressed in terms of the coordinate functions r, phi, and t. Now a metric is in particular a 2, 0 tensor field. And uh, so I can take the metric and uh, consider it also as a 2, 0, 2 tensor field. So let's subtract another 2, 0, 2 tensor field. Name the one which is given by the one from omega, tensor omega. So that's also a 0, 2 tensor field multiplied by a certain function. So the result would again be a 0, 2 tensor field. So let's see what we get. And we get a certain expression uh, for this uh, two, 0, 2 tensor field. So in this case, it is forgotten that G is actually a Riemannian metric and is just considered as a 0, 2 tensor field. All right. Now the levi civita connection that is uh, induced by a metric can be called using the method connection. So I apply the method connection to my metric and then I get uh, the levi civita connection. And if I display it, all the Christoffel symbols are computed and given as uh, functions of my standard coordinate uh, functions x, y, and z in this case. We can of course also look at the Christoffel symbols in any other chart. So for example in uh, polar coordinates what we get uh, is this expression. If you have ever computed Christoffel symbols by hand you know that this can be a tedious thing to do but Sage does it for you just in a few seconds. Now you may wonder why there are two arguments uh, in this case for displaying the Christoffel symbols. Uh, so we have uh, told Sage to use polar coordinates to display them. And we have also told Sage that the Christoffel symbols are to be uh, that the Christoffel symbols are to be expressed in terms of the polar frame. So uh, the, the tangent frame induced by polar coordinates. You could actually use two different charts for that. So for example, if we use the, the frame that is induced by the STD, the standard coordinates, what would happen is this. So we would get the Christoffel symbols um, as induced by the coordinates x, y, and z, but expressed in terms of polar coordinates. So that's kind of, of a you know, weird thing to do. You would probably never want to do that, but it's possible. So you can the frame and uh, which, uh, which tells you which components are to be computed and the chart which tells you how they are expressed and what coordinates they are expressed here. These can actually be independent. So that is this. Uh, you can also display the Christoffel symbols in a different way in any chart. Uh, so if you call the method Christoffel symbols display, then only non-redundant Christoffel symbols will, will be displayed. Only the non-zero ones and also redundant ones will be will be dropped. For example, we know that Christoffel symbols are symmetric in the lower indices. So once we know gamma r r t, we also know gamma r t r because they must be the same. And indeed, they are both minus one. So this list is unnecessarily long. If you want to have only non-redundant uh, Christoffel symbols, you can also call this method and then you get uh, the same kind of information in a somewhat shorter list. All right. Now, one of the most important things in Riemannian geometry certainly is curvature. So we can compute the curvature tensor of our metric and uh, by the method Riemann. So this is, uh, I take the connection Nabla, the Levi-Civita connection, and compute its 
Riemann curvature. You could also work with other connections not induced by the metric and compute its curvature, but we do this for the uh, Levi-Civita connection. And then uh, Sage has to do a little computation and then it, it can express the Riemann curvature tensor. So you see this is a 1,3 type tensor field. So and you, you see it here expressed uh, in the standard coordinates. A Ricci tensor is also available, that is a 0, 0,2 tensor field and if we invoke the method Ricci to the metric then uh, we can express it. Uh, so uh, we get this expression for the Ricci curvature, which is actually quite simple in this particular case. If you want to have matrix view, uh, then you use the column operator as you should. Okay, and finally you can trace that thing once more and you get the scalar curvature, uh, which is a scalar field, uh, which we, when we display it, uh, turns out to be a constant function. So then of course it doesn't matter in which coordinates we express it if it's constant. And in fact, uh, it's, uh, the scalar curvature is constant minus six. We'll come back to this uh, in a moment. Now, if you have a metric available, then you have further uh, operations that you can do with any of the tensor fields. So recall that we had defined a tensor field uh, T of type one comma two. So here it is again. So that's our tensor field T. And uh, given the metric, we can raise and lower indices. This is uh, uh, also known in mathematics as the musical isomorphism. Uh, for example, if we wanted, so if we wanted to raise the last index of this tensor, so wanted to raise this k up, this means we have to multiply by the inverse matrix of the metric. Some uh, equate, so take the same index here, sum over k, and then we get a new tensor field with, where the last index has been raised. And that's being computed by this method up. So it tells uh, Sage to take the tensor field T and raise the last index. Remember the numbering is Python way, 0, 1, 2. So it's the last index, which is, which is K. Uh, and it's raised using the metric G. And then we get a uh, tensor field of type 2, 1. And here it is. Now it's of type 2, 1. And that's the tensor field we obtain. We have raised the last index. We can also raise all indices. Uh, then we would just drop the second argument and tell Sage, okay, raise everything, raise everything up using the metric G. And then uh, this is what we would get. And then of course that would result in a tensor field of type three comma zero. Similarly, you can lower indices with the method down. So if we lower everything, we get a tensor field of type zero comma three. And that's the tensor field we would obtain from T. Now let's recall the Ricci curvature. The Ricci curvature is by default expressed as a 0, 0,2 tensor field. But if I want to uh, have it as an endomorphism field, then I need it as a 1,1 tensor field. So let's raise an index uh, to get a 1,1 tensor field. And then let's look at its matrix expression using the column operator. And then this is the matrix operation that we get. So this is the representing matrix of the of Ricci curvature considered as an endomorphism field. And we see it's minus two times the identity matrix. In other words, uh, Ricci curvature is a constant times the identity when considered as an endomorphism field. And that means that the metric is an Einstein metric with Einstein constant uh, minus two in this case. Good. All right, and um, another thing that we can do is we can take the curvature tensor or any other tensor field and uh, compute its covariant differential. So we can apply the uh, connection, not just to vector fields, but we can apply it to any tensor field. So let's apply it to the Riemann curvature tensor. The result of so the Riemann curvature tensor, remember, was a, is a uh, tensor field of type 1,3. And if we if we uh, take its covariant differential, then we actually get a tensor field of type 1,4. So let's see what we get. And now there's some computation to be done here because the Riemann curvature tensor has lots of components. In fact, such computations can, you can speed them up by, uh, by activating a parallelism mode. 
if you have many kernels uh, in uh, CPU kernels in your computer, you can activate a parallel, parallel mode and then all the kernels are uh, used for your computation. So many of the components of a ten tensor can be computed simultaneously and that can speed up computations uh, quite a bit. In this example, it doesn't really matter, but if you uh, consider high dimensional complicated manifolds, this can make a real difference. Anyway, so we have computed the Riemann, uh, the covariant differential of the Riemann curvature tensor and it turns out the result is equal to zero. So that means uh, the Riemann curvature tensor in this example is actually parallel, the, its differential is zero. And this is exactly means that our manifold is a locally symmetric manifold. Aha, uh -huh, interesting. Well, let's take a look at uh, the while curvature of the manifold. So if we compute the while curvature, we get zero. And uh, so what do we do now? So we know that our manifold has, is an Einstein manifold with vanishing while curvature. So that means we have a space of constant sectional curvature. Okay, if you know some differential geometry. And uh, we can do an additional check by computing the sectional curvature. So let's do that. So let's see what happens here. So I want to look at two, yeah, sectional curvature is something that uh, you get from the Riemann curvature tensor by inserting vector fields that span a two-dimensional plane. And I want to keep it uh, general and unspecified. So I declare six variables here, x1, x2, x3, y1, y2, y3. And then I declare two uh, vector fields, namely x is the vector field uh, which has the coordinates x1, x2, x3, and similarly y has the coordinates y1, y2, y3, so they are unspecified. And if I do that, I could, for instance, display the vector field y, and, and this is what I get. And now I compute the sectional curvature for the plane that is spanned by x and y. And in order to do that, I insert my vector fields x and y twice each into the Riemann curvature tensor. I have to first lower all indices so that I can insert the vector fields into it. And then the result has to be normalized uh, by the usual expression uh, that you know probably from the definition of uh, sectional curvature, namely the square of x times the square of y minus the product of x and y squared. And if you do that and we see what we get, it turns out we get a constant function indeed. So the, uh, the sectional curvature always takes the value minus one for any plane at any point. So in other words, we have checked that our manifold is indeed uh, a model for three-dimensional hyperbolic space. Good, so these are some functionalities of um, for manifolds in say H. There's a lot more that you can do like uh, treating Lorentzian metrics, looking and plotting and numerically solving geodesics. Uh, there's lots of things to do and in fact uh, there's a lot of functionality being added currently. So this fun this uh, Sage manifolds part of Sage is under active uh, development. I strongly recommend to look at uh, the Sage Manifolds homepage where you find a lot of examples. If you have a question about a particular method uh, of Sage in general, you can um, write down this method and followed by a question mark and then uh, Sage will give you some information about this method. Uh, so in particular, you will see in this, in the case of this differential geometric, um, uh, prop, uh, methods you will find uh, the, the way how things are defined. That's sometimes useful because in some cases there are different sign conventions and so you can check which sign convention is used here. And if you put two question marks, you will actually get access to the full source code of the implementation of your function. So that's one of the real big advantages of Sage. It's open source. So this is not doesn't just mean that it's free like free beer. It's also open in the sense that you can investigate the source code. So if you want to do, to use this, uh, this uh, computer algebra system to prove things, you should better have an open source system so that you know what it's actually doing. I hope this uh, introduction to Manifolds in Sage was useful to you. Uh, I recommend that you try it out, play around with it, and then it might be very useful for your further work.